κενήν και αι και ει του αιώνα των αιώνων αμήν. Χαίρε Αγίων ο και Θεό βάδιστον. Χαίρε ψυχε βάλτε και ακατάφλεκτε. Χαίρε ημών υπρό Θεών κόσμου γέφυρα. Η μετάγους αθνητούς προς την αιώνιον ζωήν Χαίρε ακύρα τε κόρη Η απειράντρος τε κούσα Τη σωτηρία των ψυχών ημών So last week we only got through the first five, six uh, verses of St. Paul's letter to the Galatians and we did an introduction on the uh, life of St. Paul and also how these churches came to be. Uh, as we know, there are at least four or five churches there. And the problem that St. Paul is having in these churches in Galatia, a province in modern-day Turkey, is the fact that after he left, some Judaizing Christians, some Pharisees who converted to Christianity, they said, wait a second, we are Jews and Jesus was Jewish. So, you know, we, we can't just throw the law away. We have to also use part of the law. So they were basically teaching that in order to be, to be saved, you also needed to be circumcised and keep some of the rituals of the law, some of the, uh, the food fasts and also the, uh, the different aspects of the law. Now, the moral side of the law still exists, as we're going to see today. Christ did not do away with the law. He fulfilled the law. He was the fulfillment of the law. And all the promises of God in the Old Testament to Israel confer, they find their fulfillment in Christ. And we'll talk about that and what's happening today in Israel and uh, just a little bit of uh, information on this heresy called Christian Zionism because this is the kind of Zionism that was taking place in the life of Saint Paul. It was basically putting nationality above the gospel. Christ came for the Jews, he's Jewish, so we need to also have the Christians, they need to follow some of our traditions. But at the same time, you cannot get away from the salvific, the very central teachings of the church, whether written or unwritten. And that's where we have the seven ecumenical synods that give us the correct interpretation of the gospel because saint peter says that some people some simple people when they read the epistles of saint paul become confused because saint paul was very deep he was extremely well educated he was uh, a great scholar under gamalio who was one of the best teachers of the law in jerusalem so he was more like a lawyer not a lawyer to fight cases oh they were interpreters of the law of moses and that's what uh some of the rabbis did. They, they interpreted the law of Moses. So St. Paul writes to the Galatians who are most likely Gentiles or Greeks who converted to Christianity and he tells them, I marvel, I'm surprised that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. So he's saying that when you turn away from the true gospel of Christ, you are turning away from God the Father. You are turning away from Him who called you. God the Father, who wants to save everyone, gave us Christ, His Son, to save us by His grace. And grace means a gift. And now you're turning away to a different gospel. You're going back to the Old Testament, to the law of Moses, and you want people to be circumcised. And why is that? Because when you follow a few rules, it's easy to follow some rules. Tell me what to do. I do this, 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 and this. I'm safe, I'm good. So we'll see that a lot of the heretics, when somebody goes into heresy, uh, heresy it's really a way to get rid of the yoke of Christ and create an easier path, an easier path to get rid of the cross of Christ. Uh, St. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. In what way? I crucify my passions. I crucify my own will. So 
We use the commandments of God to crucify our selfishness. So the commandments don't go away, but they don't save us. What the commandments and the Lord does, they prepare us to get closer and walk towards God. So the law of the Old Testament was a pedagogos, a tutor. It was preparing people to accept Christ. So St. Paul says in Romans that through the law, we found out what sin is. The law says do not kill. Killing is a sin. The law says do not steal, do not covet. This is a sin. The law allows you to do introspection to see where you stand. So the law gives you the boundaries, the guideposts. So we are not saved by faith alone. I accept the Christ. I did the sinner's prayer. Now I'm saved. Christ has done everything. Yes, you're justified. Salvation is yours. You got your driver's license, okay? (laughs) But now you got to put a little gas in your car. (laughs) You got to do some things. You can't just fold your hands and say, Christ has paid my price. He paid the fine. I'm saved, and I can no longer lose my salvation. These are false teachings and a wrong gospel that destroys people. The born-again Christians believe The born-again Christians and the Catholics, and these are false teachings. We'll try to mention after I go very quickly through these verses, uh, if I'm able to. I'll keep quiet. Because I I get distracted (laughs) just by my own. So, as we have said before, he says, I am so surprised that you are so quickly to turn to a different gospel, which is not another, because there's no other gospel, he says. There is no other gospel other than what the apostles taught. There's no other gospel. They're false gospels. It's people who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, just like Peter, he was perverting the gospel when he got close to this to this Hellenizing uh, Jews when they, when they came from Jerusalem to, I believe, Antioch, Peter went to sit with him because they didn't want to sit with Gentiles. These were Jews that still looked at the Gentiles as unclean. And he told Peter, St. Paul says, what is wrong with you? You're acting racist. like a Jew. You're acting like a racist. You don't believe that. Why are, why are you doing things that you don't believe? Mm-hmm. So you can be pleasing to the Jews. She says, I confronted Peter to his face, which means that Peter made many mistakes. And I wish that the Pope would choose another apostle that we don't know much about, like Jude, or someone who doesn't make any mistakes in the scriptures because, you know, there's only, we don't know anything about them. But he had to go choose Peter. But Peter made all kinds of mistakes. Now, how can you call yourself infallible after the apostle that you're supposed to be the successor of made a mess of things? He betrayed Christ. He was wrong right here. He made many mistakes. So you can see how the the perversion of the gospel takes place everywhere except in orthodoxy. That's why St. Paul starts out his epistles with doctrine first. If you look at the epistles of St. Paul, he'll first do orthodoxia. He'll give them the true doctrine and then he will give them examples on how to live the Christian life. He does this throughout his epistles. Even if we, or an angel from heaven, if that's possible, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be anathema, let him be accursed. Very strong language from an apostle, because this is a very serious matter. Having the truth is our salvation. Losing the truth will cost us our salvation. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you, other than what you have received, and received does not mean just the scriptures, because back then there were no scriptures. So those who say uh, and they believe in the heresy of sola scriptura, the scriptures alone, they don't know what they're talking about because here we have no scriptures. In the first 50, 60 years, all teaching was done verbally. So is this what the Protestants believe in sola scriptura? They believe in sola scriptura, that all the truth of God is in the scriptures alone. Sola scriptura, if it's not in the scriptures, we don't accept it. Well, that's, 
That's their way out. But that's a very, very serious flaw because here they don't know the history of the church. They don't know, you know, they, are, they simply imagine things that the scriptures just fell out of the sky. St. Paul is teaching the gospel of Christ verbally. And then he writes, as problems arise in the churches, He'll sit down and write this epistle and send it to the Galatians, write that, that epistle and send it to the Corinthians, to the Thessalonians. So this is how the New Testament came about. But the first two, three hundred years, there was no canon of the New Testament as we know it that came about after the First Ecumenical Synod by the help of St. Athanasius. It was the church that gave us the New Testament and not the other way around. So it's the church that's the pillar and the foundation of the truth, not the scriptures. The scriptures are the truth of God, but the pillar of the truth that's going to tell us that this book is Gnostic, we don't accept it, this book is an apocryphal account, St. John didn't write this, it's the church, the people who purified their heart, and by the help of the Holy Spirit, by the grace of God, they were able to discern that, yes, this is written by Paul. Why is Galatians such a short chapter? Well, actually, it's about six chapters. Jude, I think, is only one chapter. Galatians uh, goes to six chapters, but it's power packed because the work of the Holy Spirit. Who subscribed all those for him? Uh, I thought maybe Luke. Yeah. Luke was a doctor. Yeah. And while he but would I be... thought maybe he did most of them. That's what I'm asking. St. Paul didn't sit down for like three days to write this up. You know, after prayer, he would say, Luke, write this. So he would begin to speak and then Luke would write, it. write the epistle. Yes. We have said before, and he reiterates this, he talks, I mean, he repeats himself because this is extremely important. So now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received by the grace of God, you've received this from the grace of God because you would not sit there and listen without the Holy Spirit bringing you here. God knows every one of us before the foundation of the world. God knew before the foundation of the world uh, not that we would be here today speaking about His and, Son. And, me, and me giving you a hard time. <laughs> 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 That's scary what you, you say because I've heard it on TV. Yeah. It's very scary that God knows everything. Everything from the foundation, before the foundation of the world. Nothing escapes God. Hmm. So as we have said before, so now I say again, okay, let him be accursed, meaning separate from a church, separate from God, because he cannot be in the church, because he's, if this kind of delusion, if this kind of perversion infiltrates the church, then many people will be lost. Do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men, like Peter did? Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. So here we see a weakness of St. Peter, a weakness to defend the faith. So here we have apostles. That made mistakes. And that gives us a lot of courage if we sin, if we fall here. And the scriptures do not hide those mistakes. And this is another indication that the, the Holy Scripture is from God, from the Holy Spirit. Because if this was from men, so, well, you know what, don't write that in. Don't, don't include that in there. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't say that to you. Why must you say, you know, why, why must you say that Peter betrayed? Hey, buddy, don't, don't, don't include that in there. Just let that out. Peter's a good boy. Yeah. Okay. See, they, they did not want to gloss things over like we do today. St. Paul says, this is what happened. And out of his humility, Peter says, yes, I did that. I was in the wrong. And I'm sure St. Peter, because of his humility, he asks forgiveness from St. Paul. Do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. And this is the problem of us Christians today, clergy and lady. We want to have a good name with the world. We want to please the world and also please Christ. Christ. We like to serve both masters. We like sports Sunday morning so our kids can become very good and uh, you know get, get some scholarships for whatever, soccer or football or whatever. We allow our children to skip church Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And go come to church a couple months later when <clears throat> soccer is over. That's serving two masters. And the children grow up with this mentality. You know, when it's snowing out, parents will say, no, no, you got to go to school. No, you'll, you'll go to school. <laughs> or when it's raining. But Sunday morning, it's raining too. Let's not go to church. So the children find out what's really important to the family very quickly. Very well said. St. Paul says this does not work. If I wanted to be pleasing to men, then I would not be a bond servant of Christ. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to men. So in other words, I didn't get it from the other apostles because they were accusing him that he's a second-rate apostle. He was not one of the twelve. They were trying to undermine his apostleship. And he's defending his authority to preach the gospel. He's not defending himself personally. He's not taking this personally. He's defending his authority to preach Christ crucified. For I neither received that from men, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he had the gift of apostleship. In the church, we have apostles. So even after the 12, what do we call St. Constantine the Great? What's one of his titles? Equal to the apostles. Very good, Kathy. Equal to the apostles. Why? Because he freed Christianity. He told the Romans and everybody, Christians are free to worship their God. Leave them alone. You will no longer persecute them and kill them. So he opened a door for thousands of people to come into Christianity. Just like Vladimir there in Russia. He's probably equal to the apostles. To the right? Apostles, yes. The same thing with Cosmos the Aetolian. Wait, do you mean, you don't mean Vladimir Putin, do you? <laughs> you don't mean Putin. <laughs> I just want to be clear on that. He has a good name, yeah. yeah good Vladimir, name. Vladimir. <laughs> Let's not get political here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we also have Cosmas the Atolian called uh, equal to the apostles. Because he left Mount Athos and went all over Greece and he built 200 schools, not churches. 200 schools to educate the Greek children to be able to read the gospel, to learn their faith, to go and attack the Turks and free themselves at 1821. So he's equal to the apostles as uh, Cosmas, an apostle to Zaire, this monk who left Mount Athos, Sophia, you probably read that book, I believe he died there, but uh, he spread the gospel there. So this is a gift and also Elder Ephraim of Arizona. He has this apostolic gift. God called him. God told him, leave Mount Athos, go to America. He had a vision from God. So he was called to be the apostle to the Americas. And now we have hundreds of monks that are teaching orthodoxy and also practicing the faith and strengthening all of us. So the apostolic gift is always in the church. And St. Paul says, I've received my knowledge from Christ himself. From revelation of Jesus Christ, because we don't learn the faith. It is revealed to us. We can learn about the faith, but it is the Holy Spirit that will reveal his truth to our heart. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it because he was misinformed. He felt that this new sect, this new religion is going to destroy the faith of his fathers, the faith of Judaism. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace. So God knew him and was waiting for him. Now, why didn't he call him while Christ was still alive? God knows. Everything happens in God's time. Perhaps he was not ready to accept the teaching back then. But after he was struck by the light on the road to Damascus and Christ appeared to him, then he was humble enough to say, Who, who are you, Lord? It is me, Jesus, that you are persecuting. And then he humbled himself. And immediately after that, he was baptized. So even after Christ himself called him, he still had to be baptized. There are some conditions in Christianity as well. We're not just saved by faith alone. Christ says after his resurrection, go out 
and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name, one name, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to keep everything that I taught you and revealed to you. Were they baptized in the order the way John baptized uh, Jesus or a different way? You could baptize in, initially the baptism was in running water, so they right. would baptize in streams or in a lake or anywhere, but uh, or in a river. But it was a baptism of repentance to prepare the people from, for the coming of the Messiah once again. So the baptism that's going on now with other denominations, is that wrong or right? Well, denominations are not churches, and if you do not have the sacrament of priesthood, Christ is the high priest. After the resurrection, he gave his authority to who? To the apostles. Right. If you remember, he told them, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Now there, he wasn't giving them the Holy Spirit because the fullness of the Holy Spirit would come during Pentecost. When he says, Receive ye the Holy Spirit, he's giving them spiritual authority to bind and loose. Whatever sins you bind on earth are bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth, they are loosed in heaven. There, he's giving them apostolic authority, his authority to to confess people's sins and also to ordain people into the priesthood and give that gift, that special gift of priesthood to bishops and also presbyters. When you hear the word presbyter in the scriptures, that means priests. So denominations do not have priesthood, so they cannot have sacraments. But they're ministers and they study just I know, like... I know. Let me just read a couple more verses. And then after that, we explain some of these things. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he wants to show to these brethren that, look, you're following wrong and false teachers. And these false teachers will abound towards the end times. Christ is he's constantly repeating in the Gospels in Matthew that one of the signs of the end times will be the abundance of false teachers, false prophets, false Christs. I received the gospel from Christ himself. And what did I do after that? I didn't go to Jerusalem to be taught by Peter. I went straight into Arabia for three years. Here St. Paul takes three years to prepare himself to pray. And these three years he's been revealed all the gifts that the other apostles received, all the knowledge from Christ. And then after that, does he go and preach? No, he talks to a few people here and there. He goes to Jerusalem and he only finds Peter and James because the rest of the apostles are gone. After the uh, death of Stephen, they're all over the place. They left. So he doesn't find anybody. He speaks to Peter and says, this is what I have been revealed. He has the humility, although he knows it's Christ that's revealing to him. He goes just to compare notes with Peter and James and they're amazed. And then he goes back to Tarsus and spends about 10 years there talking to a few people. He goes to Cilicia. He's talking with the uh, Hellenist Jews. The Hellenic Jews? Yeah, Jews that spoke Greek. Okay. So he's conversing with them, he's speaking to Gentiles, but he doesn't go to his first missionary journey until the church calls him. The church sends Barnabas to Antioch and says, you know what, I know a good guy who knows the culture of these people around here. He knows the culture of the Greeks because he lived in Tarsus. He knows the Romans. So I'm just going to go. And he goes and calls Paul after 12, 13 years. St. Paul this says, I didn't go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And then uh, I went, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remain with him 15 days. But he didn't go there to be taught or to be directed, just to simply reveal his information that he received from Christ. Verse 20, now concerning the things which I write to you indeed before God, I do not lie. Afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. He went to <coughs> Roman territories where there were a lot of Gentiles. He was a tent maker and he spoke to people around him, but he did not start a missionary journey without being called by the church. He waited. It's a very important key. And I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea 
which were in Christ. I was unknown. Unknown. So in other words, he didn't go out to make a name for himself. He waited for God. He waited for the church. But they were hearing only that he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. Now, after three years, when he went to Jerusalem, I forgot to tell you that after he spoke with Peter and James, he went to have it out with the Hellenist Jews to speak to them about the Messiah, and they almost killed him. They were plotting to kill him, just like they killed Stephen. But the Christians got involved, and they hit him, and they took him out of the city, and then he went to Caesarea, where there were Romans, and he was saved. So he went back home, back to Tarsus, and then after a while, he went to Roman territory. But again, he did not start any missionary work until he was called by How the church. How old was he when he started all this? At 47 AD, he begins his first missionary journey. I think next, that'll be a good topic. Next lesson, we're going to do a chronology of St. Paul. That way you can answer your questions a little bit more specifically. Okay, yeah, thank that you. would be good. Thank you. Okay, so getting back, getting back to the true gospel. St. Paul says you cannot be without the true, because without the true gospel, you cannot be saved. And even the Pope says that. <laughs> Let me see where I have that information. Yeah. And that, that upset our, our, our Metro Maximus who was really close to Pope Benedict, one of the best popes. Oh, yeah. Are you talking our Mac? Uh, yeah, our, our Bishop, Bishop Maximus, Maximus. yes. Really? He went to school. He went, he went to school with uh, Benedict, and uh, they were friends. Okay. So, uh, you know, he was really excited when Benedict became uh, the Pope. But this disappointed our Bishop Maximus. He was, he was upset. Why? Because the Pope made his confession of faith around 2007. And listen to what he wrote and said. Orthodox churches are defective and other denominations are not churches. This is the Pope. In a previous document around year 2000, the Pope wrote, Protestant and other Christian denominations are not true churches. That we believe. Yeah. We agree. Oh, yeah. But merely ecclesial communities and therefore do not have the means of salvation. A little bit stronger than our bishops, huh? Yeah. If I ask, where did, where did they go to school that they went to the school? Uh, Theologi German, yeah. Theological? Was yeah, Ger he was German, I think. College? Yeah. Well, Benedict yeah. was German. Yeah. Yeah. German. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was German. Yeah. And uh, the, 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 I think Maximus also studied in Rome, you know, so they, they knew each other. <coughs> so once again, <laughs> this is this is from Pope Benedict, and uh, he says that Protestant and other Christian denominations are not true churches, but ecclesial communities, and therefore do not have the means of salvation. Now, does that mean that individual people, we don't decide who becomes saved or not, okay? Only God... Only God can do it. God will make that decision. Why, why, like, what's his reasons for saying why our church is defective? Like, what's the reasons? I mean, does he have anything to back it up? I mean, uh, he's just well, he believes that <laughs> Catholic faith is a true faith and that the Orthodox split from it. Oh, okay, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, this is what the Pope says. Okay. Christ established here on earth only one church. So he believes you know, that the Catholic Church is the apostolic church of Christ. Right. And of course, if they're Catholics, they need to believe that. Or they wouldn't be Catholics. Just right? like we have to believe in ours. Right. Right. Yeah. The Orthodox churches were indeed churches because, oh, thank you. <laughs> because they... They do have apostolic succession, but they lack something. Uh -oh. They don't have me as their pope. He didn't say that. Let me see. Oh, here. Let me, oh, let me. <laughs> I said that's so you laugh, but it's not far from the truth. Uh, they don't have, they don't believe in the primacy of Peter. And who's the successor of Peter? He is the Pope. Okay. Now, let's see. Is Pope Benedict correct in this assertion? Was Peter the head of the apostles? Was he? No, no, no. no, no. Did you, did you get that impression after what I read? Oh, no. no. He, made, he, made a lot, he made a lot of mistakes, though. Yeah. Yeah. 
impossible. There's three things, and I don't have time. Maybe another another time we'll go through this. But there's many things that divide us, and that's why we're not. That's why we we excommunicated the Church of uh, Rome at 1054 for many reasons, but. Some of the major differences, the heresy of Filioque, they changed the creed. Our creed says that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. The scripture says, Christ says, what? the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Christ says yes. that. The popes and the theologians of Rome changed that around the 6th, 7th century. And two. And they said that the Holy Spirit proceeds from from the Father and the Son, which changes the personal characteristics of the Holy Trinity. Major heresy. And I think Father Peter just invited me to speak on this sometime in Alabama on the filioque. You can come and you can use me as an audience and I'll listen. I want to do a... I learned that way. (laughs) So we will not accept the filioque because this is something that became doctrine after the 11th century. A lot of the popes never believed in this. And I think Pope Leo wrote the creed in Rome the correct way, the orthodox way. But it was after, after the Franks came over and slaved Rome and pushed Frankish heretical, heretical political bishops to become popes, then they change this doctrine. So, number one, the filioque is a heresy that perverts the gospel. The infallibility of the pope is a great hoax. There's no one infallible on this earth. Well, how are you infallible if Apostle Peter is not infallible right here in the scriptures? How could he be infallible? Well, he you, as, you tell me. Person. You, yeah. He's just a regular person. You, you go ask him. He's not here. <laughs> He's not here. <laughs> you are. <laughs> and before that, you know, be, all goes away. But he be, 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 before Vatican II, the beautiful little book, My Exodus from Roman Catholicism, has all this in there. It's historically proven in that book that dozens of popes had so many crimes, so many mistakes, so many... So this is the infallibility of the Pope and also the primacy of the Pope. In the Orthodox Church, we have a synodal system. When we have a decision to make as a church, when Patriarch Bartholomew needs to decide upon something, he will have all the bishops sit around the synodal table and they all have one vote. It's called a synodal system. In Rome, that doesn't exist. You have the Pope, whose weight is a lot heavier than the other 1,000 bishops or cardinals of the Catholic or Latin Church. If all the bishops in Rome says yes and the Pope says no, it's no. So he's basically a dictator. It's it's autocracy and it's not the way of the church. There's many, many other false teachings, the Immaculate Conception, the supererogatory works of the saints, indulgences. If you do a lot of good works and you pay a lot of money, you can kind of buy paradise for some of your relatives. Everybody would give half of their land to put grandmother into paradise. And it turned out at some point that 40% of the land of Mexico was owned by the Catholic Church. And at 1,054, we cut the church of the pope from the true body of christ which is orthodoxy so we don't have a schism of the churches we have the breakaway of rome from the true church of christ this idea that we have two churches and two lungs it's communistic thinking it is false thinking and it is not the theology of our church it leans towards pleasing the world and telling the world that yes we are willing to to, to compromise and accommodate things especially now that we need to all hold hands and, and really be united all the religions need to become united so we avoid wars that doesn't work because i believe world war one and two took place among christians in europe right So it's not religion that's going to save us, it's the truth of Christ. Because the truth will lead us to therapy. The truth and the following of the commandments and the therapeutic discipline of the church will fix, will correct our hearts and souls, and then we'll be able 
to love our neighbor as ourselves. Until that happens, if we do not follow the commandments and practice the therapeutic discipline of orthodoxy, we cannot be healed. That leaves us very little time, maybe five minutes, to talk about another very wrong deviation from the gospel, which happens to be with the Protestants today, the evangelicals, and all the commotion about defending Israel and taking sides and always taking the side of Israel. Because of sola scriptura and one verse that the evangelical Protestants base their whole theory. Idea, theory and ideology on. They found a verse in Genesis 12, 3. God speaks to Abram. He's not Abraham yet. It's Abram, Abram. God says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those that who curse, curse you. you. And all the evangelical Christians take that verse to mean, unless you are an ally of Israel, God will curse you. They take it literally. Okay. They take it literally, and because of that, $200 million are collected by evangelical Christians. Really? John Hagee, uh, Falwell, and uh, a lot of the, you know, the mega televangelists, they send over $200 million to Israel. They send their children to be soldiers there because they believe in dispensationalism that Christ is not going to come and rapture the church. Have you heard of the movie uh, Left Behind? Yes. <laughs> that's what that's all about. It's about the rapture, pre-tribulation rapture, this very hoax, this hoax of a theory that Christ is going to rapture the church before the Antichrist, before the tribulation, so they don't have to suffer. So you see how they deny the cross of Christ? They deny martyrdom. We don't want to suffer. We're good with Christ. We're good people. So he's going to rapture us. And then the people who are going to left behind are going to be the Jews and the bad Christians, those who are not born again, according to them. And then they'll have to fight with the Antichrist. And because of that, they think that's not going to happen unless Israel takes the entire Palestine. For, for Christ to come back on earth again to rapture them, Israel has to have the entire land. So whether... They it's are persecuting happen. and killing the Palestinians and taking their land. 7% of Palestine was Jewish in the beginning of the 20th century. 7%. Wow. Now they took over 70%. And as you can see, they want to take the whole thing. They you mean simply 7% of the population, right? Do you mean, or 7%? 7% of the land. Oh, okay. 7% of the land. There were only a few, very few Jews there. Most of them were all over, all over the, uh, the world. After the prophecy of Christ that says that you will be dispersed, that's the Jewish diaspora, after 70 AD, go all over the nations. And they look at the coming of the Jews back to Israel as the plan of God and something that's pleasing to God and God is pleased with this and we need to help the Jews at any cost, whether they're doing right or wrong, we have to keep our mouths shut and let them do whatever they want, however they want to persecute their neighbors. And how is that loving your neighbor? Which is you know, the commandments of God of the Old Testament as well, yes, Sophia. Isn't it ironic that they're raising $200 million to give to the Jews, but in the end they believe the Jews are going to be annihilated? So right. they, don't, they don't love the Jews. Right. They know that two-thirds of the Jews are going to die in the tribulation. They teach that in their teachings. So you can see how the wrong gospel, how it influences culture. If you have the wrong faith, if your faith is not correct, then you will fight and kill until everybody accepts Allah. So to have peace on earth, we need to have Christ. According come. to the Bible, whose land is it? According to the Bible. Let's the see here. Catholic. Okay. Kings 9, 7. If you serve other gods, this is God speak, which is Christ in the Old Testament. If you serve other gods, and they did. After Solomon, they brought all kinds of idols into the northern and southern Israel. They brought in all kinds of idols. If you serve other gods, then I will cut off Israel from the land I have given them. Those promises were made to Israel up until the point of Christ. 
the minute they crucified their Messiah, those promises no longer stand because now they're children of wrath unless they come to Christ. Unless, like St. Paul, who was a child of wrath and now he's an apostle. Matthew 21, 43. Therefore I say to you, to the bad vine dressers, the last parable of Christ to the Pharisees after Palm Sunday, after he was accepted as the Messiah from the masses. And the scribes said, why are you accepting these praises? And then he tells them this parable, that a landowner had a vineyard, and he gave it to vine dressers. And he went far away. And then these vine dressers, they kill the prophets. And then the owner, which is God, says, I will send my son. They will respect my son. And then the vine dressers say, let's just kill the son, who's the heir. And then this thing will be ours. And this is exactly what they did. And then Christ says, therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruit. So Protestants accuse us of replacement theology. This is John Hagee. Like the Orthodox Church is wrong because they, they teach that Israel no longer has the grace of God. But it's not the Orthodox Church who's teaching this. It's Christ who's teaching this. Right. This is Christ. I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation, to the church. This nation will have no Jew, no Greek, no male, no female. Everybody will be a Christian. And that nation was the Byzantine Empire that espoused all lands spread the gospel, and everybody was called Vroom Orthodox. So God didn't promise to Israel that I will you'll have my kingdom, whether you're right or wrong. It's very clear, but they don't see these verses. For some reason, the demons come and hide these verses from them. They don't see them when they read the scriptures. John 5, 43, and this is the lot of Israel. A very sad, this prophecy that God is going to bring Israel back. It's not a positive prophecy. God didn't bring the Jews back. And again, they, did, they came back with weapons. The Orthodox Jews, they don't agree with what's going on there. All the Orthodox Jews today, about 70,000 of them, in Jerusalem, they're saying what you're doing to the Palestinians is wrong. God, the Messiah, will give us Israel back, not your weapons. The political Jews tell them, shut up, you guys are crazy, you know, and they persecute them, their own people, because they teach the truth or at least what they think the truth is. John 5, 43, another very sad prophecy about Israel. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. When another comes in his own name, him you will receive. And who's that? The Antichrist. The Antichrist. So unfortunately, this prophecy that the Jews are coming back, they're coming back, to bring their Messiah, which unfortunately will be the Antichrist. Okay, so that's exactly what's happening. And that's what 70 million evangelical Christians erroneously believe and help Israel to annihilate their neighbors. Probably over a million have been pushed out of the territory so far. Where did they go to Egypt? All over the world. The rest of the Arab Muslim world doesn't take anybody in. And they have acres and acres of land. They do. If they take him in, that would defeat the purpose. That's, a, well, that's exactly what Israel wants. If they take him in, then that land is gone. This is what Egypt didn't want to do. No, don't leave your land. If you leave your land, you'll never come back. That's how politics works. Very I'm glad you think so, but there's so much that I need to cover that I didn't, I didn't cover some things. But next, next class. I throw you a crown ball, but you didn't pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> Every week we need, there's too much stuff for...